Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Threat Talk. I'm your host, Bob Hansman, and today on Threat Talk, we will be discussing nation state cyber attacks. Malware and cyber attacks attributed to nation states have been around for a long time, and a lot of people have theorized about the potential impact of such attacks, with results ranging from temporary disruptions in localized areas to an almost global collapse of civilization. So the current crisis in Ukraine and the related malicious cyber activity, both seen and threatened by governments and criminal organizations, makes it necessary to better understand the actual threat from nation state actors and realistically what we can do about it. And while examples from the current crisis are bound to come up, our goal today is to take this discussion up a level so it can remain applicable for those who have to defend against nation state actors even after things are resolved in Ukraine. So to dig into this rather complex and sensitive issue, I am joined today by the CISO for InfoBlox, Ed Hunter. Thank you for joining us, Ed. No problem. Thanks, Bob. And we also have Anthony Kiroki, the SecOps manager at InfoBlox, who's dealing with the current situation on the front lines. So I'm glad you were able to take a break and come join us today, Anthony. Hey, Bob. Glad to be here. Thank you. So I want to start today by reviewing some of the more relevant nation state attacks that we've been seeing over the last few decades that might give us hints about what we should be worried about both today and in the future. Let's let's put it in the, the realm of what's realistic. So, Ed, in years of strategizing and, and helping make these plans for information security, what kinds of nation state attacks have, have been catching your attention? Yeah, well, most recently in the news, we've seen uh, precursor attacks to kinetic warfare, right? We've seen uh, before a uh, full out military invasion that uh, there are some uh, things that governments may partake uh, in that precursor, right? So traditionally that's been holding runways and taking down radar systems and that sort of thing. But now we're seeing that uh, cyber attacks are, are taking place during that time to uh, basically prepare and confuse and distract um, a country that you know might be the uh, subject of some kind of uh, other attack, right? So that, that's one potential use case, one that's very relevant and in the news today. Uh, but there are a variety of, of other uh, ways that governments may get involved potentially, right? So uh, we've seen over the last decades, a lot of um, intellectual property attacks where uh, could be directly employed or subcontractors or just allowed to function within the borders of a country. Uh, attacks where intellectual property, such as uh, military weapons research, um, oil research, uh, all kinds of IP that uh, and trade secrets that may be uh, kept undercover by various corporations being uh, purloined, attacked. And, and uh, over time, we've seen that uh, escalate, right? Um, we've also seen ransomware, which is another form of really denial of service and um, collection of funds from uh, countries, some of which are uh, motivated by uh, trying to get a hold of, of hard currencies. Um, these include some countries that are under embargo and so forth. Um, we've also seen some attacks that are motivated uh, by revenge, um, where uh, various countries are, are looking to uh, retaliate against what they see as uh, attacks against their leaders and, and things of that nature. And uh, lastly, I, I'd say there has been a concern about infrastructure level attacks for a very long time. Uh, the US government created an organization called InfraGuard 20 odd years ago to cooperate with the uh, private sector um, on things like the protection of power grids, oil and gas, and, and things of that nature. And that conversation is, is an ongoing one. Yeah, no, I'm glad to see you you pull out the things because we today, of course, we're in the midst of of a war going on and people tend to think of it as wartime activity, but they've had a lot of practice of the misinformation. We talked about uh, that misinformation uh, campaigns that have happened around political events and elections and, and things like that, or just to downplay uh, 
something else that they may be doing, human rights abuse and things like that. Um, but it doesn't even have to be so dramatic, uh, the situation. If they can find some way to, uh, to leverage technology to their benefit, they're starting to, to learn and weaponize it in that aspect. And I remember uh, you mentioned the oil one. I remember years ago when there was a particular country that was auctioning off oil drilling offshore, uh, oil drilling off of their, uh, their country, and they flat priced everything, but they'd never done the research. So they had oil companies coming in and spending a lot of money doing the research. And it was interesting that as soon as their geological studies had come back and said, this, was a, this is a really rich field over here. This one is one we're going to want to snap up. By the time they contacted the government, the government had just raised the price on that particular lot. So it appeared as if somebody was watching them and monitoring their research so that they could manipulate it just for economic gain. So everything from economic gain to political benefits to, of course, the war, there's a lot of reasons people, uh, you know, get into and uh, nations get into the cyber warfare game. It's it's not just about war. So um uh, did you have anything to add on that, Anthony? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, it's kind of uh, it's it's the whole scenario is kind of interesting. I know uh, I don't know if you recall there was a book called Megatrends back in the early '80s by mm -hmm. this guy named John Naisbitt. Uh, one of the things he was speculating about was um, that the next world war would be over before they fired a single shot because the attacking country would just wipe out all the other countries' bank accounts. And uh, obviously that didn't happen because you, you just look at the videos from the Ukraine, but it was prophetic in a lot of other ways. Um, we've seen a lot of things. First of all, banks are a major target either for obviously for getting funds, but also for retaliation, as you mentioned, if it, they believe that they're funding some of the resistance. Um, also, there are some things that are uh, uh, really interesting that have happened with technology. I know a few years ago, um, there was a botnet made up of uh, IoT devices, you know, your do internet doorknobs and toasters and all of that. Um, and actually somebody to, uh, used this botnet to send thousands of these systems attacking this major hosting provider in France and actually knocked the country of France off the internet for several hours. Um, so there's things like that that are out there that could potentially happen. There are certain things like Stuxnet was a... Um, was a, uh, a worm that actually it was intended to have the same effect as a, uh, a kinetic warfare attack uh, by that was launched against Iran by supposedly unknown actors. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, and there's there's just all kinds of things like that. I mean, you look at Anonymous is claiming that they took out uh, 2,500 systems in Russia in the first week. And you, I saw that and I was kind of going, well, they've obviously been able to do this for a long time. Why didn't they? How did they manage to get, it was several hundred in the first hour. Um, if they've always had that capability, you know, they're kind of sitting on that, on a lot of potential attacks that, you know, they could launch anytime they wanted to. I don't know how many of them were zero day, how many might've been just, probably the majority were old systems that hadn't been patched and whatnot. But uh, yeah. um, if you can believe anonymous, uh, that's a pretty major striking number. Well, and you have organizations like Anonymous who are, they lean more towards hacktivists uh, mm -hmm. versus the financially motivated criminal organizations where, hey, if there's no money in knocking a broadcast station off the air, why do it? Um, whereas Anonymous right now, they are motivated by, you know, it's a loose connection. Uh, if anybody wants to dig into that, uh, you know, just check the Wikipedia on it. It's not your best source, but it will give you a good idea of just uh, how different that is than your normal uh, organization. But, you know, I, I'm you, the reference you made to the book, so many of the predictions around, oh, it's nation states start doing this. I mean, look, they've got, you know, armies of hackers that they can, you know, have at their disposal and and their capabilities are far above that of corporations and blah, 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 and, you know, criminal organizations. So, oh, the, the whole world's going to be thrown into the world of Mad Max. You know, we're going to have Thunderdome with a bunch of... Uh, you know, computer scientists fighting it out under the under the dome or something. Um, but that's not really what we're seeing because that's not really what they want to do. I mean, it is a little bit more um, purposeful, I think, is, is the way they, they do it all as purpose. Ed, as you were saying, sometimes it's simply to exact a little bit of revenge because, you know, you maligned our, our leader who, you know, we believe is deity or something. 
um, or you uh, are preventing us from doing uh, something that we want to do, as in the Ukraine war, we're interrupting that. Um, so there's a lot of backlash over that. But, you know, they have a purpose in it. And I think that's the one big difference. I, I was actually preparing for this. I went back and looked over a lot of old movies and all the ones where the world does get thrown into some apocalypse. It's because somebody releases a virus and it gets out of control, which is not um, has, you know, it's not a new idea. Matter of fact, Anthony, you and I were talking about this just several weeks ago with the, the worm where the, the author was in the Philippines. He only wanted to spread this right. virus to show how much he loved this girl in the Philippines and it got away from him and it went all over the world, shut down email for a day or two. You know, it, it, it was an interruption kind of a thing, but um, you know, again, there's so much of this is very apocalyptic. So, can you put us, you know, you're on the front lines, you're on the SecOps team here, Anthony. So what are you really worried about? What are the kinds of, you know, if you, if something gets through, and of course, as a good security person, you're planning that something will get through someday. How bad can it get for you, really? Um, well, it, it the likely scenarios are different than what could happen. What could happen is really scary, but I don't want people yeah. to like freak out and panic. Um, there, uh, although it's really fun to talk about others, um, you don't want to have, you know, like running out of toilet paper and stuff like that. Cause everybody goes rushing out to the stores. Um, there's, um, you know, rent, there's a lot of talk about ransomware, uh, being a, a likely thing to happen. Um, I think more likely it's going to be the more fake mock ransomware where, you know, I uh, think things like, you know, not pet you where it just kind of encrypts stuff, asks for money, but it really just wiped out your hard drive and they're really not not uh, expecting money or they'll take it if they if you send it. I think that's more likely simply because attacking countries, nation states, or even um, non-government organizations are really not interested in waiting for the money. They, they're interested in throwing you off so that you're like thinking, do we pay, do we not? What do we do? How do we get our data back? When really they've already they've already wiped it and gone on. You know, yep. um, so there's it's I think it's more likely that we'll get kind of the mock ransomware attacks, if anything. Uh, and then, of course, the, the one of the new buzzwords is wiper attacks, at least uh, it seems to be being used a lot where they just, you know, that's the whole intent is just wiping the data. There's a lot of charity scams that are already going on. You're seeing a lot of that for these different phishing attacks. Banks are, as we mentioned, are going to be a likely target. You might want to actually consider. Um, how that Im Im impacts you, you know, it's not just the bank, it's suddenly your credit card it doesn't work, you know, um, so may want to keep some cash on hand. There's also possibilities with water processing plants, you know, do you have water for a few days, maybe you want to keep some of that on hand. A um, lot of concern about the power grid, although that's a little, I think that's a little less likely because there's a potential there for civilian casualties. Um, so if you're thinking about the, the whole scenario about attacking the nuclear power plant and causing a meltdown, they're going to probably avoid that. Um, although they could potentially knock out power to places. Um, one thing that most people don't think about is satellites, you know, um, satellite communications. I mean, when's the last time you think the government actually updated, <laughs> patched their satellites? You know, I don't know. Maybe they do it all the time, but it's probably some old operating systems up there. And most of the traffic is unencrypted. So it can be eavesdropped, it can be intercepted, and you have a man in the middle attack. You know, what happens when you don't have any internet and no cable news because the satellites have been taken out, you know? Um, what happens when the, you don't have any uh, dispatchers available because not, you know, partially because of COVID. I mean, I saw that during the last snowstorm. I actually saw to, uh, snow plows just parked for the first day. They were just parked. There was snowing like mad and they weren't driving at all because there were no dispatchers to tell them where to go. You know, and they're not just going to randomly drive around and plow whatever they want. Um, but that 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 can have serious impacts for the supply chain, you know, for the trucking industry, you know, um, smart cars. What happens when you can't unlock your car door? You know, <laughs> um, it's different things like that. You know, um, that you could you check YouTube if you have that problem. You check YouTube, except YouTube will probably be down, too. Right. Yes. <laughs> You know, I, wanted one, to, I wanted to highlight yeah. something, though, here. I wanted mm -hmm. to highlight something in particular is that you, you've mentioned this a few times, but I want our listeners to realize you've mentioned several times in several ways for a few days here, for a while, that these are all temporary disruptions. They're not the, 
the whole financial system, your credit card's dead and will never work again. It just doesn't yeah. work for a day or two because the ATMs have been hacked until somebody can fix them within a few days. You mentioned the transportation system. These are uh, chains. As a matter of fact, Ed, uh, I want to ask you, since you know, you're know you at the CISO level, you're, you're dealing with business issues and how all of your uh, efforts maintain the business. If you've got a I mean, you know, most of Infoblox is now a lot of cloud oriented stuff, but you still have appliances, they have physical deliveries. Um, we have dependencies on a lot of other companies. Um, if they're shut down, if they get impacted, how much of an impact does that have on our business? Yeah, you know, since Target, I think there's been uh, a lot of increased scrutiny on third party um, service providers and infrastructure providers, uh, of which Infoblox is one, right? Um, because back to Target, they got compromised not through their information security system directly, but through a subcontractor, an HVAC vendor, right? So, and, and, and most recently with Kasaya, you see, again, going through a third party in order to gain access to other companies, right? So there's increased vigilance in that area. And, and frankly, we're subject to that as well. That goes both ways. We ask our subcontractors what their security measures are and question them about their resiliency and their preparedness uh, when incidents come, come about. Um, and uh, similarly, you know, we're, we're questioned about our customers as well, about our, our reaction and, and readiness. So I think it's a very, uh, very timely issue now. Yeah, and I remember uh, they were asking about our update and maintenance policies, which thank heavens we don't have that satellite challenge that Anthony was talking about. Um, but Anthony, I, I'm sorry, I know I interrupted you there, but I wanted to make sure that we highlighted everybody that th these are all things that the predictions and the scary stories over the last decade have always been complete outages of this and total disruption of that. But that's the press going from what used to be a purely journalistic thing to now having to attract attention like Hollywood. So they, they tend to, you know, hype all this stuff up, but they are all realistic scenarios. I think the biggest issue, would you agree, is that Everything we've probably heard could happen, but the impact is probably going to be short term versus the nightmarish long term that we've heard about. Would that be a fair way to characterize it? I think that's very fair. I mean, you look at even well, you look at. I, I think a lot of times the breadth of the uh, um, um, uh, panic about certain things is stronger than the actual duration of it. Um, if you you know. Um, I, I don't want to say that COVID kind of came and went, but we're on the tail end of it now. But three years ago, I don't think anybody could have predicted where we're at now or where we've gone, come over the last, you know, two and a half years. Um, so, yeah, that was you know, temporary in that sense, but it's totally changed everything. And I, th I think I think there's there's the um, the amount of panic can oftentimes have a bigger effect than the actual attack. Um, if you look at the toilet paper issue that we were talking about earlier, you know, people do making a run on, on, uh, you know, uh, uh, double mint gum for some reason, you know, I, I couldn't buy a doorknob for my house. I don't know why there was a rush on doorknobs, uh, but Home Depot was out of them. Um, so all these things, you just kind of never know that, you know, off, oftentimes there's, there's not a reason for it. The main thing is to just um, not be kind of sucked in because there will always be some people that will just kind of uh, uh, panic and overreact and do what they think is best for their own personal concerns and buy, you know, 10 years worth of toilet paper. But really, you know, if you can just get by for a couple of days, get a, you know, a five gallon jug of water and some canned food, and you're probably going to easily out, out, outride anything that's going to, uh, has a reasonable chance of happening. Yeah, I have some friends who get the bottled water, you know, those bigger jugs of bottled water, and they simply called the company and said, I'd like to have one more on hand. That was yeah. it. That's all they had to do. They're prepared. Um, you know, so it's, you know, life won't be normal, but uh, um, it also doesn't have to be uh, Mad Maxian. Um, but let's take a shift. We're about halfway through our, our time here. And I'd like to talk about uh, the enterprise from a security standpoint about, you know, what are the kinds of things we should be focusing on. So I'm um, going to go back to, to Ed, you, because you're, you know, again, to clarify for people if they didn't hear the title here. Um, so Ed, you're the CISO. You're dealing with the strategy and the planning and making sure that everybody's following those plans and so forth, whereas uh, Anthony's um, on the front lines executing a lot of this stuff. So from a strategy standpoint, what are the kinds, you think, uh, kinds of things you think about to be ready for any of these kind of disruptions? Yeah, I, there, there, 
are several phases, right? One is preparedness, which you can do in advance of any event or declared event. Um, and then what you do during that event um, and how prepared you are to actually execute during that phase. Um, so just using uh, what's in the news most recently, the Ukraine affair, right? Um, there, we have a task force and we have enhanced vigilance and monitoring that we're executing on now. Um, and, and that's due to plans that we've put into place months and years ago, right? So back to preparation and execution, right? Uh, during the event, communications is, is super important, coordination. Um, but the people on the ground, Anthony and his team, uh, they're keeping on top of the news. Well, we all are uh, communicating with all the other teams, making sure we're looking at uh, any uh, attack patterns or IOCs that may be used by those nation state actors, um, keeping on top of any kind of uh, uh, vectors that might begin an attack, like unpatched servers or emails and that sort of thing, making sure that we're just doubly uh, doubling down on, on those kind of measures and vigilance. And, and frankly, the next day, our third party, uh, our, our customers are going to be uh, calling us and asking us, hey, what are you doing, right? Not that we wouldn't do that, <laughs> irregardless, but um, um, they'll, 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 they do ask ask for the story, which I which I think is an enhancement that wasn't around ten years ago. Um, we kind of just trusted our vendors to be doing the right thing, and maybe they were, and maybe they won't. We're not right. Yeah. Um, I, I would also say that uh, end users, our, our our users within the company, are a, a super important first line of defense. Um, and second line of defense, right? Uh, in the sense that uh, the email comes in to them first, right? The spear phishing, the attacks. Um, are you going to click on that link? Are you going to install that? Are you going to go to that website, right? Uh, having people uh, just be doubly sure that they're um, clicking on safe links and, and not falling for these scams, super important. And, and then what I mean by second line is if they do, call us, right? let us know so we can actually do the investigation. So all, all those are, are, are pieces of the, of the puzzle. Um, next, I'd, I'd say resiliency. Um, that, that kind of goes back to architecture and preparation. Um, if you just got one server that's not redundant or it's not behind a load balancer, uh, that is a problem, right? <laughs> it goes down, you know, is it backed up? Does it automatically recover? Um, have you tested that? Have you ever tested that? Maybe you think you have backups. When was the last time you actually tested your backups? Sometimes uh, you'll go back and you'll find out, well, I don't, I, I've lost three days of data because I only back up once a week. Or someone didn't put a, a tape or, you know, the more digital analog these days. Um, it's, it's writing to a volume that doesn't exist anymore. Or someone's changed a script or a password and it's not functioning. You have to test these things. Do you want to find out about that during an event? Or you want to find out about that during a test and go fix it, right? So there's yeah. there's a lot you can do to prepare, and and it's 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 really difficult to get anyone, everyone to to really take that seriously because it's you, you've got your to do list and you have all these people that are asking for things today, and and are you going to spend your time working on something proactive for something that may or may not even happen, right? So there's a mindset there. And, and a strategy and a longer term vision that you're not just doing what you need to do today, but you're preparing for all these contingencies. And so Anthony, Anthony is going to say, so how does this get realized at your level? I mean, what are you guys doing to execute on all this strategy? Well, a lot of it is, as Ed had mentioned, is following the news. You know, we, we, we proactively look for certain things that are going on in the world that uh, may impact our business or just our people. And we will actually launch investigations, not because we got any kind of an alert or anything, but just in case, you know, uh, we all, we publish our own, uh, Infoblox publishes our own uh, threat advisories and things like that to, to, to customers and, and on our website. And we always check for all of those um, just because we certainly want to be, have keep our own house in order. Um, also, I think it's really important uh, that uh, um, we review, and I, I encourage any company to do this, is review uh, what you consider your acceptable risks. You know, there's always a balance between security and just the ability to, to do your work. Um, 
And so because of that, some some security issues you'll just deem as not not quite as important as, you know, getting the business needs. So um, you'll let some things stay uh, at, a, at a higher risk level. And th that should be reviewed because maybe temporarily people, you know, can can be inconvenienced for the next week you know, um, but in order to make yourself more secure and then, you know, bring it back as necessary, you know, make sure all your systems are patched, um, um, especially the legacy ones that you never think about. Um, and, and, and again, kind of just building on what Ed was saying, you know, educate your personnel, um, uh, exercise your procedures, do tabletop exercises, all of that. Just make sure you're as prepared as you can be. Well, we're down to our last uh, few minutes here, and I wanted to end up, and I'm glad this is kind of where you were leading us, Anthony, is let's talk about the employees themselves. Um, and Ed, uh, I, I know that you have done a lot on this side, so I want, you, again, let's do, have you do strategy, and we'll have Anthony talk about how he's executed and what he's done. But making sure your employees were prepared for this current disaster, um, I got to see that firsthand. So why don't you share how important and why you even worry about the employees and their families when they're not on your network? I mean, your company runs on your network, right? Yes, definitely. So I think, I think you could separate the groups of employees into ones that are directly affected because they're in an affected area. Uh, whether that's an employee or a contractor or a service that you're getting out of that area, um, part of that is the strategy of, of whether or not you'll accept services or hire or buy services from a country that's in um, an unstable area or a place that might affect your operations, right? Um, and just speaking for Infoblox, we, we didn't have any employees in, a, in the directly affected areas, but we did have some subcontractors and, you know, we, we did get involved and ask the questions and offer our support and that sort of thing. Um, and it all turned out fine. So uh, there's that, the, the direct, um, directly affected employees, but there's also indirect impact, right? So if, if we lose services for a particular product or for a particular piece of infrastructure or supplier, um, that may impact any part of the business, right? So how quickly can you pivot off that? Um, so those conversations have ensued and we've talked about perhaps getting, mo moving some services that we purchase out of certain areas, right? So, so work is happening in, 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 in that area as well. Um, I, I would also submit that there's a certain amount of uh, employee employer uh, dialogue that happens just in, in how much the company can support and help employees directly uh, when something goes wrong in that area, right? And that, that, that may not be a war zone, but maybe there's a snowstorm and you lose power or something like that. Um, employees, can do something to ensure that um, they're not impacted and they can still uh, support and help the company and do their um, whatever their position requires. So, for instance, if Anthony gets stuck in a snowstorm and, you know, the, the, his, his uh, uh, computer loses power and he's not able to connect and, and, and protect the company, there's an impact there, right? So do we have a geographic redundancy? Um, do we buy Anthony? Um, a generator for his house, um, you know, there, there's a discussion that can be had, right? And and one end of the spectrum is, oh, well, you know, maybe we should go buy 2,500 generators and send them out to everybody, every Infoblox employee, just in case, um, which might be an over pivot, right? But, you know, we may have an employee in Alaska who really needs that, and we may judge that to be, um, uh, a good mitigation, right? So there's, there are conversations that can happen. And, and I kind of refer, refer back to the preparation phase I referred to earlier, right? You have those conversations and you have those risk discussions and you, you make a reasonable um, business orientated uh, conclusion on whether or not you're, how far you're go willing to go, right? What, what makes sense for the company? What makes sense for the employee? And so Anthony, I'd like to pivot to you just to wrap this mm -hmm. up then, because you sent out a wonderful little email not just telling employees how to prepare themselves, but also their families. Yeah, I think it's very important that uh, that you 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 think of things that uh, kind of outside of the box. I mean, some things are, I think, fairly well known, but not maybe thought of that much. You know, the email links hovering over any link that you go to or that you're before you click on it. But also just be, using common sense as far as you know, am I really sure this is coming from the person that I think 
it came from. Um, and uh, uh, is does it make sense that that person would send me this type of a of a of a of a message? You know, would the CEO of my company be telling me about this uh, Ukrainian prince that has twenty seven thousand dollars in a bank account for me? Uh, that probably wouldn't happen. Um, uh, make sure you install multi-factor authentication on your home um, uh, applications, and as well as you know, uh, they probably are doing that at work. But you want to do that. Uh, you don't don't. If you find a USB device on the ground, I actually had somebody do that to me. He wanted me to copy some files for him, and he handed me a USB drive. And I just happened to ask, "Where did you get this?" Before I plugged it in, he said, "Oh, I found it in the I found it in the driveway." And it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you don't you don't find a USB device and plug it in your computer because that is that's bait. They'll they'll lay them out there. Um, be careful about using public Wi-Fi. Don't expect this to work in an emergency. Uh, they don't talk about that too much anymore, but people used to always have landlines in case of emergencies. Well, in the case of where everybody is trying to call to find out where their loved ones are and all of that, how are you going to do that if you don't have this? Do you have a meeting place maybe somewhere that uh, that you've agreed on ahead of time that you're going to find, you know, find each other, that sort of thing? Um, and then we talked about keeping a few days of essentials without going crazy, you know, just a little cash, uh, water and some canned goods. Um, just kind of common sense stuff, uh, but uh, think about it uh, at home as well as at work. Yeah, and this is kind of some of that indirect stuff that Ed was talking about. Sometimes you're, um, uh, you know, um, we're talking about, uh, you know, the employee is not going to be productive if they're worried about their family at home, you know. Yeah, I, I was able to get in today. Um, thank you very much for the snow tires or whatever you provided me. So Anthony made it to work today, but he's not at his at his best because he's worried about his family because they don't have electricity or heat and things like that. So taking care of the whole whole group works. And um, you know, Anthony, you're you were talking about the phone there, um, you know, and losing phone communications. Um, a lot of people have noticed, uh, particularly in North America, how the uh, pay phones have started to disappear. That used to be part of our emergency response. They were required to work that if an entire area went out, the pay phones were supposed to be the number one thing that came up um, before even hospitals and things like that, because communications are key. But today we depend on cell phones and that whole infrastructure is privately owned, no longer regulated. Um, it could be uh, really hard just to reach people. Um so there's just a lot to think about. And again, I, I thank Ed in particular, because you pointed out there's those that are directly impacted. And definitely um, there's a lot of extra mile that a lot of organizations have gone to, uh, read some wonderful stories and LinkedIn. Um, I'm glad we didn't have to even consider some of that, but um, you know, that's the way a good company should, should respond and care. But if we're looking at the cyber impacts of the economy, for example, um, you know, what do we do if all of a sudden the ATMs stop working for a day or two? You know, how do you, because you know, a lot of people still don't, they don't have a week supply of food in their, in their cupboards. It's amazing how people, um, where my wife works, she says almost every day, most of the people in her office, they're going to swing by the store to pick up something because they, they don't plan ahead. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that, uh, we need to encourage our, our employees to do for their family so that they are also prepared because these are the kinds, these nation state attacks they aren't just targeting, um, you know, stealing the plans for the latest uh, fighter plane from Lockheed or whatever. They are uh, they are encompassing attacks that would impact everybody everywhere. Um, almost no country is safe right now. And um, but again, keep it in context. Be prepared for little disruptions. Be flexible, and it works. So Ed, I'd really like to thank you uh, for joining us today and sharing the particularly the high level strategic. Uh, uh, planning and, and the way you've thought about these types of things. Thank you. Sure. Glad to be here. And Anthony, for coming back again, um, like I said, I knew you were on the front lines because you were the one sending out emails. Again, as Ed said, it's regular communications. It wasn't our regular monthly newsletter from IT. We've been getting regular communications and updates, reminding us about patching and the home advice. Very good stuff. Um, but unfortunately, and as usual, we are out of time. So I um, want to thank you both for joining us. And I want to thank all of our viewers and listeners for your time. Join us next time as we continue our efforts to help you stay on top of cybersecurity and ahead of cyber risks on Threat Talk.